Hello, in this video we're looking at what is it like to spend Christmas alone as the family scapegoat. So I hope to provide you with some validation, acknowledgement, support, insights and help with this. My name is Mary Toulon and I am a scapegoat child recovery specialist. So what is it like to spend Christmas alone when we're the family scapegoat? It is very difficult, it's very challenging. I have done it, I've been the family scapegoat, I've been estranged from my family of origin for a number of years. And even when I was in contact with them, I didn't visit for Christmas. Um, so I have experienced the isolation and the loneliness and the shame that goes along with that as well. Um, so the family scapegoat is rejected and ostracized and pathologized by the parents, by the siblings, um, rejected uh, from the family unit. So very often we can find ourselves in a place of low contact or no contact and it's just too painful to be around these people and we've made that choice that it's preferable not to spend that time with them. So it often doesn't lessen the pain. So it's painful to be in the same room as them um, and it's also painful to be not spending Christmas with family members. You're definitely not alone with this experience. There's many people from all over the world who are in a similar position, who come from dysfunctional families where people are unable to treat other people with respect, where there's no boundaries and where there's a lot of chaos and fear and confusion and bullying taking place. Um, so you're definitely not alone in your experience with this and the challenge um, and the sense of dread as the holiday season gets closer and we come closer to December 25th and all the triggers that are go around with that. The main struggle that we find with being the family scapegoat and spending Christmas alone is the grief that goes with that. So very often because the grief is so complex, if we're low contact or no contact, um, it takes a while to process all the grief associated with being the family scapegoat. So if we haven't gone through the depth of all the layers of that, definitely it's going to start cropping up as the holiday season appears. The feelings that we experience around this time of the year are the loneliness, that sense of, you know, not having any family members, no DNA, no extended family members, the rejection, the injustice of it. We didn't do anything wrong. We were a child when we were being rejected by the parents and being pathologized by the parents. Uh, so it's very confusing, it's very baffling and there can be shame along with that as well. The abandonment wound is a big piece so this can definitely be getting triggered at this time of year um, and the heartbreak and the shame. So these are all very very challenging emotions for us um, and as the holiday season approaches it may be a case where we're trying to distract ourselves from the pain of this, trying to numb out and uh, maybe we have some addictions that we go to to deal with the pain of this and we haven't received any, you know, good proper support with this. So it makes sense that we're going to be struggling if that we haven't found anybody to help us 
navigate the pain, understand the pain, process the pain, get to the other side of the pain. So I think it's important to understand um, the amount of grief that we will have from being in the position of the family scapegoat and the decades of severe bullying, manipulation, mind games and brainwashing that we've been exposed to. The grief that we experience from being the family scapegoat is very, very complex grief. This can take um, a long time to process and go through the many, many layers of it. So it can crop up at the holiday season. It can feel very, very overwhelming. And if we haven't received competent support um, around it, then we can be left feeling very unsupported and we don't know how to deal with the pain. And often it is the inner child that gets triggered, the abandonment wound gets triggered and we can be blended with the inner child um, and we can be in a emotional flashback with that. So it feels like we're a five-year-old being left on the side of the street with no mother and father, nobody to take care of us. It's that feeling of utter abandonment and rejection and isolation and terror. So definitely if we haven't been able to access the tools to heal from complex childhood trauma, definitely these can be getting triggered around the holiday season when everywhere we see the messages of happy families and people having a great time being in this cozy environment with a warm fireplace and lots of lovely food and laughter, connection, belonging. It emphasizes and it highlights things that we didn't receive and weren't available to us in our family of origin. So this time of the year definitely presents that big contrast to what we missed out on, what we didn't receive, um, a lost childhood and lost family members. It can also bring up um, that fantasy that we need to create to protect our psychology when we're a child and teenager and adult to minimize the abuse and the attacks. Uh, we have to tell ourselves it's not that bad. They don't really mean it. They don't understand. I'm being too sensitive. It's my fault. I'm to blame. The more we heal from that, the more we see the level of dysfunction in the family of origin and in the lineage. So, and we can feel like we're the only person um, dealing with this because most of the people that we know don't understand this and when people don't understand it they invalidate and when we receive invalidation that's a big injury to us and it's very damaging to our mental mental health um, to receive that invalidation. So all of these things crop up at this time of the year uh, it can be like an exposed, raw wounding. Um, it can be very, we can feel very vulnerable with it. And of course, isolated and alone because we don't have sufficient help um, to deal, to deal with what we're dealing with. If people don't understand this type of abuse and trauma, how can they offer support and healing? So this is the big struggle for us and the core of the pain of what we can be experiencing. And of course, that sense of dread coming in. Here we go again, you know, another big happy family season where it's everywhere I look and that's not my lived experience. And I don't feel that way. And of course, as humans, we're very social creatures, uh, we need connection, 
uh, belonging is like a very deep uh, need for a human and when we don't have that we just feel cut off from humanity cut off from the world like we're just floating off the side of planet earth which is a very difficult feeling to experience and of course we want to run away from that feeling so what i would say to you if you are in this place with your scapegoat child recovery um, is to i'm going to use the word com compartmentalize if i can pronounce it compartmentalize the grief so we can say to ourselves okay the grief is over here i acknowledge that the grief of this wound is very very complex and there's many many layers to it there's many many things that we're grieving when we are the scapegoat child we're grieving family members who are still alive uh, we're grieving them as if they're deceased because we probably won't see them again we're grieving the fantasy that we created to survive about who they were that they were good people that it was our fault we were to blame but they were good honest loving people so we have to grieve that let that fantasy disintegrate uh, we have to grieve the childhood that we didn't get to live uh, grieving the parentification that took place in childhood that we didn't get to be a child because we were taking care emotionally of the adults and grieving all the lost connection um, and not being able to be ourselves not being able to walk in the world as our true self because the amount of trauma that we experienced we created a false self so we were living as a different person um, and the loss with that the years of our life that we didn't get to live as ourself and feel like ourselves so the grief of scapegoat child abuse is highly highly complex so when we're coming up to this season if we just acknowledge to ourselves okay there's all that grief is there and what we can do perhaps is set an intention for the new year okay i'm going to really start looking at this grief because the thing about it is it's so painful when we have unprocessed grief but as adults it's so painful when we haven't processed that grief either way it's very very painful so rather than falling into the intensity and the overwhelm of the grief that is going to come up to the surface around december 25th when we are very very triggered it's understanding okay that grief is there that grief is in my system there's a lot of things i haven't processed yet but i'm setting an intention that come the new year this is something i'm going to look at i'm going to seek out help for it and seek out support for it and i'm going to titrate it so what we do is we take the grief in bite-sized pieces um it's almost like uh think of it almost like a project with lots of different moving parts so a very complex project that you might be embarking on and how would you approach that definitely before we step into it it can feel very very overwhelming very very confusing where do i start what's the first step and we just need a road map with that so yeah i'd invite you to say to yourself okay this grief is here because it's coming up it comes up every year and it's not getting any less so i need a different strategy to help me move through the grief so that would be one piece of it and then we can say that 
um, just creating a type of plan for the day. Another piece of the pain and the loneliness we experience as being this ostracized family member for no valid reason whatsoever, um, is that we can imagine that the family members, they're all together, they're talking, they're sharing food, they have lots of people around them, they have a sense of belonging. It can be so acutely painful. And of course, in childhood, it was so, so painful. And now as an adult, we have more understanding about it. We have more perspective. We have more education. We can see it from a wider angle, like a bird's eye view. We can understand the dysfunction, the insanity, the trauma that is sitting within our family and that that goes back generations. So with that understanding and knowledge, we can then ask ourselves, what am I missing out on? By not being in that family home um, with parents, with siblings, with extended family members, it feels like they're all together sitting around this cozy fire with lots of lovely food. I'm over here on my own and being shamed for it. Um, so if we make a list of what are we missing out on by not being there on December 25th, think of all the pain you experienced with those family members who are not very well in their head because they are continue to abuse children and they don't have intention of healing, they don't have understanding, they don't have empathy, they don't have a capacity for change and they're not interested in change, they're only interested in the status quo. So some of the things you might be missing out on are chaos, um, bullying, seeing other family members being bullied, all the jibes, all the criticism, the underhanded comments, the gossiping, the talking trash about other people who aren't there, the small mindedness and the energy in the room of like people who are very depressed and not well. So yes, on one hand, people are together and kind of safety in numbers and maybe some false sense of belonging, but really get some clarity on what exactly am I missing out on. So it would be helpful to make a list of all the um, abuse, abusive behaviours that you know these family members are addicted to. And that will maybe ease uh, your mind a little bit that, okay, I don't have to deal with that. And I don't have to deal with being targeted um, as the family trash can and all those jokes that occur every single year. And, oh, we're just messing. We're just joking. You're so sensitive. We're just having a laugh. But the jokes are very targeted to pierce your heart, to be painful, to hurt your spirit, and they've no intention of changing and they lack empathy. Individuals who lack empathy are unsafe people to be around. So perhaps you're not missing out on as much joy, happiness, celebration as a part of your brain might be telling you that you are missing out on. So what we can do is take an empowered approach with this. And a question that is good to ask ourselves is, what's the most empowering thing I can do for myself on this day? And I like to create a plan for the day, have a bit of a timetable and create lovely things. So imagine that you have a very special guest coming to your home 
and what type of preparations would you put in place for that guest? So lovely food, maybe lovely flowers and stuff like that that you enjoy and you are going to be that special guest. So it can be helpful to treat ourselves like royalty. So to counterbalance the pain and the triggers and the heartbreak of that day, it can be helpful to shift perspective and make it an amazing day and just go to the trouble and the effort and taking action to prepare your favorite food and things that you want to do and perhaps spending the afternoon reading a book and just resting, watching your favorite movie, perhaps doing some arts or crafts or something that you really enjoy or exercise or spending time in nature. Make a list of all the things that you love and that bring you joy and making a special effort, which sends a powerful message to the inner child. The inner child will wake up and say, oh, oh wow, all this effort just for me, even though I'm here on my own and I'm not giving to somebody else, or like it's easy for me to pr prepare for a really special visitor to come, but to do it for myself feels like a little bit something I'm not used to. So it definitely can be a very powerful message uh, to that part of the brain to give you confidence and say, yeah, I'm, I'm special, like I'm a special guest. I'm going to go to the trouble of creating all my favorite food into a gorgeous meal. Um, and I'm going to treat myself very well on this day that can really counterbalance um, the pain and the heartbreak of the day. And not that we're brushing that under the carpet, not at all, but we're just going to offer ourselves some relief for the day and do something different. So we're changing the neural pathways that we have associated with that day. And also, how about if I was to ask you in mid-January, oh, tell me, how did Christmas Day go for you uh, last year? And if you were to say to me something along the lines of, oh, Mary, you'll never guess. It, actually, it wasn't that bad at all. I actually had a lovely day. I enjoyed myself and it was, it was fine. So if that was your answer, sort of reverse engineer, what things did you put in place for that to happen? Um, and how do you want to feel on the day? So if I ask you in mid-January, how did you feel on Christmas Day? And what do you want to answer that with? So things like peace, happiness, contentment, gratitude. I had, I had a lovely rest, you know, it was amazing. I didn't, you know, sat on the sofa, watched films and wasn't feeling any guilt. And along with that, it's recognizing that the family unit that we came from is dysfunctional, not healthy people, and they're not in alignment with our values. We're on a different trajectory to them because we value healthy relationships. We value healthy connection. We value authenticity. We value honesty. We value justice and um, happiness and peace of mind and respect towards other human beings. So alongside everything I've spoke about today, you might also then like to do some, you know, visioning for the next year, moving forward and creating a vision, of a very empowering vision of what your life would look like, could look like, that you'd like it to look like. 
and this can be things like what type of people do I want to surround myself with? What qualities do they have? What things do I really enjoy that when I'm doing them, I lose track of time and it's like a meditative experience. Things such as like art or painting or dancing. What does your inner child love to do? They're, the inner child is like very, very creative, very imaginative. Um, so that can be very empowering for us when we give time to that. Um, thinking of your career and all different aspects of your life, what would make the next year just a wonderful, wonderful year. So it's good and helpful to do that type of work and stepping into joy and happiness and empowerment and who would you be without this trauma. And at the same time, what we're also doing is down in the doldrums of the trauma also. Like we don't um, ignore that or we don't invalidate that. We know that that is also there. So we're kind of working at both ends. And I hope that has been helpful for you, giving you some tips and if it resonates with you, if you are struggling with spending Christmas and the holidays alone and feeling isolated this year, perhaps you can just pop a message in the comments and say what part of the world you're in as well so that other people can know that it's not just them. They're not just the only person in the world who feels so ashamed to not have uh, a loving family, to not receive love from other people. Because definitely for the family scapegoat, nothing that we've done wrong, we're not a bad person, and we didn't set out to hurt our parents when we were age five. Uh, so that's all just uh, the insanity of what we grew up with. And we can move forward into a healthier life with peace and happiness and joy. And that is very much what I wish for you. Thank you for watching.